uh, good to have all of you here joining us for Sunday morning service uh, right here on Zoom, which is our new normal. And uh, I'm really excited because today we are kicking off a marriage series. And for those of you who know me and kind of the history I've had in ministry regarding marriage, this is a, a very important topic to me and it's something I enjoy teaching on. And we're trying to uh, meet some of the needs that you are facing right now. And we're going to get into that in a minute, but I want to introduce uh, a wonderful couple to you, uh, uh, Doc, or as we know him, Doc, but uh, David and Jenny Lavelle. Um, Doc, I got to know him on our Ride to Rosemary group. Some of you know that we do this uh, cycling event every year, and we ride our bikes from Memphis to Rosemary Beach, Florida. And uh, Doc Lavelle has been a big part of that group, and he's a cyclist here in the community. Uh, more than that, he's, uh, he's a doctor, a surgeon. Uh, retired now, and he and his wife, Jenny, have been a part of our church since day one, and uh, are really the kind of couple that I just want all of us to be able to to look up to, and, and that's one of the cool things about a church family is the more we get to know one another, the more we get the benefit of all these different people and all these different relationships. This is the body of Christ at work, and so today, uh, and I believe I'm right, Doc and Jenny have to confirm this, uh, you're coming up on 40 years married together. And, right. and so, man, what an incredible milestone. And so lots to learn from this couple. And I just have invited them. And every week during the series, we're going to have a different couple share a little bit of their story, some of the highs and lows of uh, what it means to be married. And so uh, we're going to invite Doc and Jenny to share now uh, a little bit from their 40-year journey together. So Doc and Jenny. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate that very much. And guys, um, we, Jenny and I are very humbled uh, to be with y'all. Uh, we certainly don't have a perfect marriage. Uh, we do have an old marriage. It's nearly 40 years old. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say by any means that we're a mature marriage. A not mature old. marriage, not old. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't say that we're uh, a role model that uh, certainly uh, is not for everybody. We have had challenges in our lives and we'll touch on that. So, Andy asked me to briefly talk about, we're talking about how we fell in love and how that was the easy part. And then staying in love or staying married and having a strong marriage, that's the hard part. So we um, fell in love the first time we met, I think. Actually, we started falling in love before we met because she was a blind date and I called her on the phone and you know, we visited for an hour and I said, let's go out. So we, we started with that. Uh, I was in medical school when we met. I was uh, 25. It was October 7th, 1978. And I'll never forget the day that we first went out. It was a blind date. We hit it off right off the bat. Uh, within three weeks, a month, I knew we wanted to get married. Here's the caveat. Jenny's father at the time was dying of prostate cancer, and um, we knew that he did not have long to live. Jenny's mother had had a heart attack three weeks before we met. So there was a lot of trauma and drama going on in our families, her family in particular, at the time that we met, at the time we got engaged. I asked we met in October and I asked Bill, my father-in-law to be, to marry, or if I could marry Jenny in January, because we knew he didn't have long. And actually he did pass away later that spring. So this conversation could go a lot longer than just a few minutes. Um, since then, we've had a lot of real big highs, a lot of real low lows. We're still dealing with some of them. Some of them we've been able to work through. Um, we have three children. Jenny wants me to remind everybody. We have three children. We have one grandchild. And uh, we're grateful to be part of Grace Valley. Um, we realized quickly um, after we married um, that we came from very different family models. Um, we needed to choose what we wanted our family to model after. 
I came from a household with 12 children, um, six biological children, two adopted children, four plus foster children. Um, our home was a major gathering place. David came from an awesome home, but three kids, and they were welcoming home, but much calmer and much quieter. Um, he was, one thing we think is important, um, but in like regards to sharing, three. He had had his own room, he had his own clothes, his own closet. Me, um, I had some personal things, definitely, but it was like a community closet. There were six girls, you know, different ages, but um, I didn't have my own bedroom except for a year before I went to college. The sister right above me went off to college. So um, we had to, David didn't know that um, sometimes you shared your shirt, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but we also realized we were a team. We needed to be a team. Uh, for example, it wasn't his residency, it was our residency because um, it, it, it's just a, a important factor that, um, I supported him financially, but I supported him um, physically and emotionally. And, and he supported me also, but it was a team. It was our residency, our home. Um, we both were raised with uh, a deep love for God and the importance of church family. And we wanted to still be seeking God's, God's path and God's will for us. And so we had to be intentional about it because life is really busy. And part of that was through relationships and we were involved in reach group. And I think Grace Valley is calling it home church. I don't know the different names, home church, but we had to be um, intentional. And um, we felt that that just, you know, a plus for that it's you build relationships deeper in, in those uh, relationships or or visits mm -hmm. because rather than, you know, the few minutes before church, the few minutes after church, which is always wonderful, but you know, it, it can't have too much depth in that short amount of time. And so the last, especially 10 years, um, I guess you'd say our, our family word um, is abide. And so that, that's something that yeah we do. So there's several, concepts or ideas that we've tried to incorporate in our marriage um and we have we have a few silly rules like we never have a serious conversation after 10 o'clock at p.m uh <laughs> because they always uh degenerate and so uh we cut off any kind of serious talk by 9 30. we uh i don't try to have a conversation with jenny early in the morning um it just it can, it, it, it can well, happen. Well, it can happen, but it's generally not a good idea. And so we have these little silly family rules, but we also have some concepts. So one of the main concepts is being kind to one another. Always, always, always think about what you're going to say before you say it. Play it if you can in your head and say, is this going to be kind? Is this going to come across harsh? Is this going to come across as being overly negative or critical? Because it's easy, especially if you're used to being in charge, like I'm kind of used to being in charge of the operating room or the clinic or whatever it is I'm doing. It's easy to come across as being critical. And so that isn't where it ever needs to come from. Another concept we had was we were going to spend a lot of time in prayer just because we feel better if we pray together about whatever's happening. It's hard to make some decisions. Uh, I mean, we will go back and forth and back and forth on a decision. Uh, and if it's a tough decision, if it's even an easy decision, sometimes prayer has to be part of that decision conversation. And then the third thing I would say is, Relationships don't happen within minutes. They happen within years and, and it takes time. 
when I went into practice, uh, Jenny and I were deciding what practice for me to join. One of the main parts of that conversation was what practice gave me the opportunity to have the maximum amount of family time. And where I worked, I was so grateful that I had that opportunity. So as a result, I almost never missed a chorus concert. I almost never missed a play. I almost never missed a, uh, Dan was in wrestling. I never missed a wrestling match. Um, just because I had to make that a priority time is of the essence. I mean, we've got limited days, limited months, and limited years. So that's a big part of it. Um, we also wanted to be consistent in showing appreciation for each other um, and, and just simple things. Say thank you. You know, I didn't know until my kids were in high school that David really didn't like green beans. You know, <laughs> he, he ate them. He was thankful for anything that was at home to eat when he was there. Um, transparency. And I mean, no secrecy, um, except for Christmas and birthdays. You know, um, that was the only time that we, we could do that. But we know all the passwords for each other, uh, computer accounts, Join accounts. Um, sharing, sharing is really important. The, really, really I is. Mean, we have to share. Yeah, and um, find my friends. That's mostly for safety, but it's also for accountability because most of the problems that we have seen with friends and couples that we've worked with that have challenges is because of the lack of transparency. So, okay, um, uh, temptations, we would share those if there was anything, um, awareness that came to us of a temptation or a threat, uh, we would share that with the other person, but we would also, the other person couldn't become hurt or jealous, but be thankful for that other person sharing um, because that, that's a safety. Um, boundaries, specifically in relationships, um, just one example, David had a fabulous assistant for 26 years. Mm -hmm. Never once did they go in his office and close the door. You know, you just have those boundaries uh, just to protect themselves. Any of the gifts we gave, they were from both of us. They weren't personal. They weren't secret. I don't know if that makes any sense, but everybody at the hospital knew he was a family man and ask about the kids, you know. So that's it. We've run a few minutes over, Andy, uh, but uh, I hope this has been helpful. It has. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you one question, if sure. I could. Uh, if you're, and I don't want to, obviously you share what you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, would you mind sharing one of the, the difficult seasons you've gone through as a couple and what helped you get through it? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, okay. so for those who don't know, we did lose our youngest child in a car accident when she was 20 years old. And that was, that will be 10 years ago this July. Uh, and I mean, nothing compares to that. Uh, we also had our oldest child two years later, two years later get cancer. And uh, she was 29 at the time and she had advanced metastatic lung cancer. Um, and so those moments are just overwhelming. Uh, she did recover. She's now in remission. So praise God. She does. So, so grateful. Uh, and she's one of the reasons we're at Grace Valley, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, I would say the things, there are two or three things that I can come to that help us through that season. Number one, Jenny and I got help. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to counseling for over a year after Liz's accident. We went to it again when Kate got cancer. So I mean, we got help. I mean, there's, it's okay to say we can't handle everything alone. We can't handle everything by ourselves. Sorry. I can't be in the middle of figuring out what to do at the time that I'm the one that has to be done. It's like trying to operate on yourself. Um, you cannot figure out what you need. 
you need to ha have someone help else help you figure out what you need. The, and so that's good. The second thing is intercessory prayer. There were times when I couldn't pray, probably times when Jenny couldn't pray, period. I don't mean just a little bit. I mean, period. And while we were in that season, people were praying for us. And how valuable it is to have God hearing prayers on our behalf at a time when I couldn't pray for myself. There was um, 20, there was um, one fellowship, so many of these people we didn't even know. There was a 24 hour prayer chain for us for months. People would set their clock and get up at three o'clock in the morning to pray for us. You know, um, I really think that's the only way we survived. There's more to Andy, but that's a flavor. Well, thank you for sharing that. I knew that that's a, a particular part of your journey that uh, you're still dealing with and still walking through. And I think it's important for us to be able to share some of those things uh, in the context of church family like that. I know that some of you watching Jenny and Doc share, um, you're relating to their story. You're thinking, wow, that's not too different from me. Um, you know, even just some of the, the things that you shared, simple things, kindness, appreciation, transparency, boundaries, things like that. Those are, those are things we all need. They're sort of universal principles. And it, it's a good reminder that a couple like you that have faithfully managed to stay married and stay relatively happy for 40 years, um, it gives all of us hope that, you know what, our, our struggles and challenges are not unique to us. Uh, we all have the same kind of human condition that brings on the challenges, and we've got to be um, at, at some level willing to to walk through those things and and figure out how we love one another through ups and downs and and just through the the years and years of life. And so, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, and I think I just want to let everyone know you're you're going to hear a story similar to this every week as a part of our series. Um, and part of that is just wanting to help you guys understand that um, just like Doc and Jenny kind of landed on that point, um, there are some seasons you go through where you just can't do it alone. You don't have what it takes. And, and it's not that you are somehow uh, wrong for not having what it takes. We just have capacities that we can't manage everything. And we need a, a community around us to help us walk through some of those difficult times. And just by getting to know the stories, that exist in our church gives you the opportunity to be able to say, Hey, maybe next time I see doc, I can ask him a question. And maybe next time I see Jenny, I can ask her a question. My wife and I actually did that a few months ago. And, uh, something we were facing in our family, we asked, uh, doc and Jenny for some advice and they were incredibly gracious to give us some advice to help us do something. And so I just want you guys to know, just like they said, um, everybody needs help sometimes and, uh, and don't be afraid to ask because, uh, that's where you start to get help and uh, start to grow. So uh, if you would, uh, let's uh, open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians four, and we are going to jump into this uh, discussion about marriage. And uh, man, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Uh, stop trying to have a good marriage. And uh, we're going to get into why we called it that. Um, this is, but this is sort of born out of this idea that I have talked to so many couples over the last few weeks that that reveal this principle. When you change the status quo, that's when you start to see the weaknesses, the flaws, the struggles, the inconsistencies, all the gaps start to get exposed as soon as you change the status quo. So the fact that we've been thrown into uh, a stay at home order, a quarantine, you suddenly now have to digest new parts, or at least I say not new necessarily, but you're having to face again some things in the other person in your marriage that you haven't seen in a long time. Um, and just so you know, if you're not married and you're watching this, this you're not excluded because relationship principles travel across all types of relationships. But when you get in a situation like we've been in where you're, you're closer than you've ever been, you're around each other more than you've or at least been in a long time, it starts to expose those weaknesses and those issues. And what you start to realize is, wait, these things have been there all along. We just haven't seen them. We've sort of settled in. If you've been married for over five years, my projection, my guess is you have sort of settled some issues. At least you've made peace with them or some version of making peace with those issues in your spouse. Uh, things you don't like, things that annoy you, you just sort of say, okay, I'm just going to live with it. 
And because you've arranged your schedules in certain ways and because you've learned to just avoid certain things or issues, you just learn to navigate life together and you just sort of dodge things until something like this happens and you can't avoid it anymore. And you get on each other's last nerve and you push the limit just one more inch. And, and that's when things start to sort of blow up. You thought you knew where the mines were in the minefield and you were good at dodging them. And now it's like someone rearranged everything you knew. And that's the nature of marriage. So um, there's this, uh, I know that someone's going to suggest, because I've been around this topic for a really long time. Someone's going to suggest, Andy, shouldn't you just overlook people's weaknesses? Uh, isn't there something to that? And I'll read you a Bible verse that says that. In Proverbs 19.11, it says, a person's wisdom yields patience, and it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So when you start to see the offenses in your marriage, it is a good thing to be able to overlook an offense. But here's the key to, the, to that principle. It is only to your glory to overlook an offense if you actually overlook the offense. And I want you to catch that because we think, okay, I should overlook the offense. Most people, um, I, should, I say this without any data. I'm not trying to make a, a data-driven statement, but in my experience working with couples, couples who say they're overlooking the offense are not really overlooking the offense. They are setting it aside for now and, and we're saving it for later. And that's generally how things work. It is like, I'm, I'm going to hold on to this in case I need it later. So that, that is not overlooking an offense. That's not to your glory to do that. Overlooking an offense means actually overlooking it. It means not allowing the offense to block your view of the worthiness and the, and the beauty of another person. And so the goal for you is to say, okay, I'm going to truly overlook the offense. But oftentimes, the offense or the struggle or the difficulty we're going through, the flaws and the weaknesses, they actually serve a purpose. And it's actually a good thing even though they're painful. Uh, the flaws and difficulties and struggles are like little agitators that set you up to grow. It actually helps your marriage improve and grow, but not like we think. Because when, you, when we talk about this idea of, of pursuing a better marriage or having a better marriage, I would 100% say that is a good thing to do. Everybody wants a better marriage. Unfortunately, a lot of times we talk about it like, like you would talk about working on your car or wor working on a project at work. Like I want to do, I want to, I want to improve my car. I want to improve this project. I want to, uh, I want to go work in the yard and make the yard look better. It's marriage is not this separate thing that you work on. Like you go work on your car or your, you know, yard work or a project or something like that. Marriage is an institution that absolutely requires people. And so, yes, marriage in itself is sort of this institution or this idea, but it's only as good as the people that are involved. And so you can never separate the husband and wife that occupy the union. And so when we say, when I, when I say in the series, stop trying to have a good marriage, it is not saying stop pursuing good things. It is saying the focus is not a good marriage because you have no control on that. A good marriage is the result of something else. A good marriage is the outcome of something else. And that outcome or the, or the something else to, to reach that good outcome of a good marriage is working on you. It's working on yourself. And so um, this unique relationship called marriage um, is special and unique, but it operates according to three like vitally important elements. And I want you, if you have a pen, you'll write these down. You will never outgrow these three things. These are things that every healthy relationship needs, especially marriage. Um, you need personal responsibility, boundaries, Doc and Jenny just said that, and accountability. And we are going to hover around these things a lot as we go through this series. But personal responsibility, that is saying, I'm going to take responsibility for me. And then boundaries are under, is the understanding that all healthy relationships have limits and boundaries to them. That's why you agreed to vows on your wedding day. It's why Doc and Jenny have little rules that they follow in their marriage because those things are boundaries that, that guard the healthy relationship between two people. And then the third piece is accountability. In other words, we have to accept the accountability that comes with making these decisions and live accountable lives, meaning we answer to someone else. Not only do we answer to one another in marriage, most of all, we answer to God. 
And that's what, that's what starts to bring the change that we're looking for in marriage. So um, I, I probably received four or five uh, emails, text, or somebody reaching out this week on help me in my marriage during like this whole coronavirus thing has made it more difficult or it's exposed all these issues or we're facing other challenges. And so I really want to, to invite you guys to receive this series a little bit like you're going to counseling. If you have never been to counseling, I want to encourage you to just keep that door open to the opportunity when it's appropriate, when you have that, that chance, it is a healthy thing to get some, some extra help. We're going to walk through a part of Ephesians chapter four. This has been a series that we've been in and it's brought us right up to this point where we start to learn about what God's word says about relationships. And this is, this is how we understand love. You see, if, if we're going to really understand how a couple loves one another, we have to keep our eyes on personal responsibility, boundaries, and accountability. Any other version of love that eliminates one or more of those three things is not really love. That is a, it is an, it's an imaginary love. It's a, it's a pretend love. Real love says, I will be personally responsible for me. See, if I take responsibility for you, that's not love. That's called control. And, and that's, that's opposed to love is control. And so I'm going to be responsible for me. Boundaries exist. And people say, well, that's conditional love. All relationships have conditions, even in the presence of unconditional love. We still have to have boundaries around how this relationship functions. Um, even, even God does that with us. So there must be boundaries. And then there must be accountability. It means we have to answer for the commitments that we make. We have to live according to those things. That's what love really means. So Ephesians chapter four, Paul is presenting what I'm going to call the golden truth of relationships. This will be probably the most life-changing thing you will ever hear me say. And I say that a little bit sarcastically, but I, it is a powerful thing that I'm saying here. Paul says, do your own work. And that's what the scripture ultimately says. And I'm putting it into my own words. These are words that I have um, uh, assembled as I've gone through some of my own journey. Um, and I cannot get around that the, the one factor I'm in control of in terms of relationships and particularly marriage is the, is the ability to do my own work. I can't do my, I can't do Amanda's work for her. She can't do my work for me. I can only do my work. And when I talk about work, it's the work necessary to bring a, a more healthy person into the relationship. And every single married couple watching this has a, a thing or a thought in their mind about the other person in the relationship. Man, I wish my spouse understood this. I wish my spouse would do this. I wish they would talk better this way or, or, or act better this way. We all have things that we wish the other side of the marriage would do better. The problem is we have no real control on the other side of the marriage. And if you attempt to seize control of that, you cease to have a marriage. You now have a dictatorship or some sort of uh, controlling relationship like a master-slave relationship. That's not what marriage is. So when it comes to marriage, the only thing I can do is do my own work. I can take care of me. And so we're going to walk down this road and look at that. I'm going to try to make all the appropriate caveats along the way, because I know there are always exceptions that people will bring up and say, well, if, you know, do I not say anything about my spouse's bad behavior? Do I just put up with it? And I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, the answer to that is no, you don't just put up with it. There's, there's boundaries. That's why we go back to that word boundaries. There's, there's only so far you take someone else's bad behavior. You don't sit there in a marriage in an unhealthy situation and get run over or mistreated your entire life. That's not how that works. That's not how Christian marriage works. We'll get, we'll get to those things. And as you think of questions as we go through this, it's one of the beautiful things about what we're doing uh, during this season of uh, stay-at-home church is if you have questions, I want you to send them to us. Send them to me. Send them to Nikki. Put them privately in the chat on the Zoom. I'll be happy to address those questions generically, and no one will know that you asked the question. And uh, you can send those in and uh, we'll talk about these things. I want this to be a helpful time for you. So Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 25, um, we're going we're gonna to see what God is teaching us about relationships. Starting in verse 25, Paul says, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. So right off the bat, the one thing you see is this is not marriage specific content. Paul is not addressing husbands and wives. 
he is addressing relationships. He's addressing, addressing how we treat our neighbors, how we treat one another. And this is one of the things I want you to take away with you is that the romantic relationship we think of in marriage is actually built on the basic human interactions that, that drive all healthy relationships. In other words, you don't get to just leapfrog over basic human relationship principles and have a great marriage. And so when he says here, tell the truth, we all say, duh, right? All good relationships require being honest and telling the truth. However, if you don't master telling the truth, even from your pre-marriage days, if you don't learn that telling the truth is important, you won't suddenly be a truth teller when you get into marriage. So Paul is bringing us back to some of the baseline truths about how all relationships work. So I'm going to give you the freedom to apply this to your marriage, but also know this is how we're to treat everybody. We're to be people who tell the truth. So God wants you to take personal, take personal responsibility to tell the truth. This is a fundamental value that honors relationships. And in marriage, particularly, everybody figures out how they can get around telling the truth. The longer you're together, the more you see the, the gaps and the hidden little corners and the secrecy areas, all the ways that you can sort of dodge the truth. And, and I just want to encourage you, God is calling you back. If you've been someone who's harbored a lie or been deceptive in some way, God is calling you through this scripture to come back and be an honest person in your marriage, to tell the truth uh, when you talk to your spouse. Um, every lie that you tell it gets easier to tell the next one. And it becomes this tempting uh, pathway that takes you away from a healthy relationship. And so I know that some of you would say, I don't tell lies. I'm, I tell the truth. In, in our speech, we sort of defend ourselves. I don't tell lies. At the same time, you can, you can tell lies by simply uh, allowing deceptive behavior. And uh, this is, I heard this one not long ago. I couldn't believe this. Like my wife and I, we, we try to do our best to have good communication around like our budget and our finances and things like this. And I didn't realize this. So forgive me for my stupidity, but I did not realize that people will go to the grocery store and buy groceries with their like debit card. And then when the, when the little card reader says, would you like cash back? People will put in, I'll take $40 here. That's like their sneaky way of getting getting more personal money in a way that's hidden from their spouse because it's on the, it's on the receipt for the groceries. And it's like a sneaky little trick. And some of you are going, Oh, wow, I got a sneak, a new sneaky trick, but this is how you get around your budget. Right? So then your whoever does the finances at your house, your husband or your wife, they come in and go, man, we're spending a lot on groceries. Gosh, I don't know how we keep up with this. We got to cut back on this. And you say, okay, I won't buy organic anymore. I'll buy the regular stuff, but you're still getting your $40 every time you go to the grocery. That's called lying. That's called being deceptive. That is destructive to the marriage. And so that's just one little example. I didn't realize people did this kind of stuff. I'm like, wait a minute. We got to be a team in marriage. But we all have our ways of being deceptive. We all have our ways of answering questions in dodgy ways so that we don't tell the full truth of some issue. And this is what God's calling us back to. To do your own work means deciding on your own taking personal responsibility to be someone who is honest and tells the truth. So I want to encourage you, if you're not a truth teller, be honest. Now I want to talk about the difference between honesty and transparency. Uh, Doc and Jenny shared about transparency. Uh, honesty and transparency are different things. Honesty uh, leads the way to transparency. However, you can be an honest person without fully being transparent. Some of you do not have a marriage that is capable of transparency yet because you don't feel safe in that relationship to truly be transparent. And in that case, I would tell you, you're not ready for full transparency yet. You're only ready for transparency when the trust factor in the relationship is high enough to be transparent. How do you grow the trust in such a way that we can be transparent? Well, you have to be honest. You have to tell the truth. So telling the truth leads the way to transparency, which by the way, transparency is a, a foundational uh, element to intimacy. You won't have intimacy, true intimacy, without transparency, and you won't have transparency without telling the truth. 
So this is how we grow in our relationship. This is how you get better in your marriage. Decide today, I'm going to be a person who is truthful. I'm going to be a person who is honest. And I know we all, this is like the gut check, the, the, the reaction we have in a relationship. We go, but wait a minute, but what about my spouse? They don't tell the truth all the time. They're deceptive. They do this. And I'm going to tell you, you have no control over what they do. Can you, can you ask the question? Can you hold them accountable? Certainly, that's a different part of the conversation. But you don't have control over whether they tell the truth. You have 100% control over how much you tell the truth. So we're going to do our own work. I'm going to do my own work, and I'm going to tell the truth. Verse 26, next verse, Paul says, after, after saying, don't lie, he says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Uh, verse 27, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. All right, this is, this is powerful stuff. I'm going to call this the principle of managing your own emotions. Managing your own emotions. Um, anger is the, the particular emotion that's being addressed here. And Paul says, don't sin by letting anger control you. You see, God does not want our emotions to control our decision making. He wants us to manage our own emotions and not allow that to lead to some sinful expression. And we talked about this earlier in the study of Ephesians, that we can understand sinfulness not as simply as doing something bad. Sinfulness can represent separateness from God, being separate from what his will and his ways. So sometimes our anger or, or our emotional state, whatever it is, our default emotional state, it separates us from the things of God. It separates us from God's will and his ways. So part of what we have to do when we feel our emotions is not stuff your emotions or pretend they don't exist or deny your emotions. It is to do your own work to manage your emotions so they don't separate you from the approach that God would have you take in a relationship or in your marriage. And so he tells us how to do that. He says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, I've heard this verse misapplied my entire life. I've been told, oh, this is why you don't go to bed angry and you stay up all night fighting with your spouse. That is not what it's saying here. Actually, the emphasis is on you, not the relationship you're in, believe it or not. The emphasis is don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. The emphasis here is you do the work you have to do to manage your emotions in a reasonable amount of time. You go take your anger and you go sort it out by yourself. Now, what if you have to confront someone? Confronting someone is a different issue. That should be done in the effort of the best interest of the relationship and the best interest of the other person. By the way, and I'm going to take a little side note here on confronting. Um, confronting should always, 100% of the time, confronting someone in their sin or, or their behavior should always be done in the best interest of the person you're confronting. Most of the time when we confront, we're confronting because we're angry and we're frustrated and we want to get our way. That is selfishness, which by the way, is why every time you confront someone, it blows up in your face because you're doing it for you. And they, they sense that, they smell that, and because of it, they react to it. And, they're not, and you're not going to get anywhere. So Paul says here, don't sin by letting your anger or your emotions control you. Instead, take the time quickly today before the sun goes down to manage your emotions, to get them in check, to understand how you're feeling, not to deny how you're feeling, understand how you're feeling. Because if, you're, if your emotions are, are off the chart or are in control of you, he tells us the result of, of what happens. Your anger, your out of control anger or emotions, give the devil a foothold. It means that it, it allows evil in the door. And some of you who have struggled with anger or other emotions, you understand what I'm talking about. You understand what happens when anger gets the best of you. It feels like the devil just took the wheel and he's running your relationships all into the, into the ditch. Now, here's what I would tell you. When you take the time to properly manage your own emotions, to understand how you feel, to articulate how you feel, to put good boundaries around your emotions and, and, and bring appropriate safety to your situation, when you manage your own emotions, I believe the opposite is true. It doesn't say it explicitly in the scripture, but I believe it's true. 
I believe you give the Holy Spirit a foothold in your life. That's how you invite the Holy Spirit into that situation and say, okay, God, I need your help managing my emotions and dealing with this stuff so that I don't, I don't let my emotions drive this whole situation. So uh, one of the ways that you can do this, uh, and my wife and I have practiced this, we learned this um, from a gal named Brene Brown. I don't know if you're aware of who she is. Brene Brown is, is not necessarily a Christian author or speaker, but she writes on uh, uh, shame and, and emotions and how to manage uh, your emotions. She does really great work. Um, I would encourage you to look up Brene Brown. Um, she has a Netflix special that I think every married couple in the world should watch. Um, it's really fantastic on dealing with shame. If you've not watched it, go look it up on Netflix, Brene, B-R-E-N-E Brown. And, uh, and I do recommend that to any couple that can help uh, understand how to deal with their emotional state and expectations in relationships. So we robbed this uh, statement from her. And because when you start to feel your emotions, you naturally feel in marriage the need to talk about that with your spouse. The problem is most of the time when we try to confront those issues, we end up making it come off like a blaming statement. We, we're, we're essentially blaming our spouse for how they make us feel, which by the way, your spouse can't make you feel anything. Um, they can do their thing and then you can feel a certain way. So what we do is we end up blaming them instead of actually taking responsibility for how we feel. So I want to give you a sentence that will help you articulate how you feel and actually talk to your spouse in a healthy way about your emotions. And it's uh, this sentence right here. The story I am telling myself is because emotions generate a narrative in our mind and we start to tell ourselves a story. So if your spouse ha walks through the, the kitchen and makes a snide comment about something and it hurts your feelings, well, you're, you immediately start to tell yourself a story. And the story you might be telling is, uh, uh, they don't like me. They think I'm uh, a waste of their time to talk to. Uh, they don't like the way I look or, or they don't value what I have to say. And so you will start to internalize that narrative. And you'll start to run on that narrative and you'll start to respond accordingly in your relationship to that narrative. And instead of giving that, uh, that emotion and let it, th that kind of power and letting it control you instead, you're not going to let the sun go down. You're going to process that and you're going to go to your spouse and you're going to say, Hey, the story I've been telling myself all day is that you don't like me. You don't think I'm worthy to talk to. You don't value what I have to say. That's the story I'm telling myself. And you're taking personal responsibility for that, that narrative in your mind. Your spouse oftentimes will say, oh, that's not what I think at all. In fact, I was thinking completely the opposite. I feel like you don't like me and that you discount what I have to say. And, and then you get into a much healthier conversation where you actually realize, oh, we appreciate each other a lot more than I realized. And that's how you begin to grow through these situations. And I know I'm painting sort of a, a perfect ideal picture, but it's important to be able to articulate your emotions in a way that's healthy and not blaming the other person, but taking ownership for yourself and taking personal responsibility for your emotions. We have to understand that emotions are one of the ways we forfeit rational thought. We actually forfeit more than that. We forfeit spiritual thought. We forfeit godly thought when we let our emotions take control. So the appropriate place for emotions is to help us understand how we feel. They are, emotions are great at doing that. That's, they're perfect for helping us understand how we feel. They are not real good at making decisions. Emotions can't be trusted to make decisions. So I always say uh, emotions are great passengers and terrible drivers. Don't let emotions behind the wheel, but bring them with you because they'll make the journey a whole lot more fun because you'll get to feel things and that's fun. So we want to bring our emotions on. Now, I want to also give you this. It is always wise to be aware of your spouse's emotions. It's good to know how your spouse feels. Sometimes you need to do an emotional check with one another. Hey, how are you feeling? Be aware of your spouse's emotions. That's okay. It is not okay to try to manipulate, dismiss, or control their emotions. You, that's out of bounds. When you try to control how your spouse is feeling, you, you, you run the risk of, of, of manipulating, controlling, and demeaning their emotions. You want to be aware of how they feel. You don't want to control how they feel. 
And if your spouse says something about how they feel that makes you uncomfortable, that is not their problem. If their emotions make you uncomfortable, that is not their problem. That is your problem. And you may have to process. I don't like that they feel that way. That's how they feel. You don't get to tell them you can't feel that way. That's out of bounds. That's controlling and manipulative. It's important for us to, be, to res highly respect and regard this emotional side of relationships. It is, it, your spouse's emotions are holy ground. And you don't get to just tell them how they feel, which is why you can only take ownership for you. Okay, I have beaten that in the ground. Um, let's go to verse 28. Paul continues, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others who are in need. So I know that you're probably not a thief. You don't steal stuff when you go to the store. Most of you don't do that. If you do that, stop doing that. But that's not the point. I want to I wanna address thievery and stealing in a relational context. Because what does the thief do when he steals? The thief is trying to meet a desire or need in a destructive or harmful way. That's what he's doing. So here, I know that you're not stealing from stores, most of you, but we do this. We become thieves in relationship. We try to meet personal needs and desires in destructive ways in relationship. Is that what you do? Are you a thief in your, in your marriage, trying to, to, to meet personal needs and desires in destructive ways? Maybe you're stealing from your spouse by demanding that they have to act in certain ways to please you. Maybe you're selfishly holding back from your spouse as a way to manipulate so you get what you want. That's called stealing. That's being a thief. And so what's Paul's instruction here? Literally, do your own work. Look what he says. Use your hands for good, hard work. Now, he's talking, obviously, about the, the nature of a, a thief who steals things. Instead, instead of stealing, he, he's instructing the thief, well, go to work. Go get a job. Earn your living. Earn what you need. And in relationships, he's saying the same thing. Instead of putting all of your needs and desires on your spouse, you need to do your own work so that you bring the healthiest version of yourself to your spouse so that you're not this needy, desperate thief who has to steal. Instead, you're going to earn it through trust and building a healthy relationship. This is interesting. This is what First Peter says. He says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Verse 7, give all your anxieties or worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. See, one of the first things we need to do with our desires and needs is we need to go to God. And I know it's hard because we feel such a desperate need for that, that particular set of, uh, of things that we think our spouse can provide. A certain affection or emotional things or needs. Uh, we have these desires we want our spouse to meet. The first place we have to go is to God and say, God, help me understand my needs. Because what will end up happening if we don't go to God first is that we will, um, we will end up placing God expectations on another human being in our marriage. And they will, it will be unrealistic and it will be, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have no way of being able to meet all those needs. And so, our first place is to start with God, gain his wisdom, and adjust your expectations accordingly so that when you come to your spouse to have certain needs and desires met, they're appropriate for your marriage. Some of you, your, your desire to be pleased will never be met by your spouse because they aren't God. They can't make you happy because you've not decided you're going to be happy anyway. You've got to come to God and say, you know what, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my happiness to you. And what will, what will end up happening, this is interesting, what happens to the thief when he actually goes to work? Then he's able to give generously to others who are in need. So what happens when you do your own work and you bring your desires and needs to God? Well, suddenly you're filled with the richness that he provides. You sense the peace and the assurance that he gives, and you're able to then bring goodness into your marriage. You're able to actually, instead of bringing neediness and desperateness to your spouse all the time, you can actually bring something of value to them. You can look to meet their needs. You can bless them. What a, what a, what a turn in this, whole, in this whole thought is instead of having to go and take from my spouse, I actually get to give them something. Why? Because God has filled me up. 
And so I don't need my spouse to fill my every need. I am fulfilled in God and then I can go and meet their needs. I have, I have never seen two desperately selfish people produce a good relationship. It doesn't work. That's the old saying, that's two ticks and no dog. It just doesn't work. That will make your marriage suck. So forgive me for the silly joke. Um, so um, your spouse is not God and will never be able to completely uh, bring fulfillment to you. So only God defines your worth and you need to bring your insecurities to him first and then appropriately bring the, the right issues into your marriage. Let's go to verse 29. Paul continues. I'm telling you, this stuff is like super practical. This isn't, this isn't 401 level. This is 101 level. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So this is interesting. Paul is saying, use your words for good and not evil. Luke 6.45, Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So why are our words so important? Your words are so important because they tell a story about your heart, which is why your words in relationships, particularly marriage, are vital because they tell something about your heart. Words are the outward expression of that internal reality day in and day out. So it is important for us to really watch our language and our words. By the way, this is not a verse that says whether it's okay or not to use cuss words, okay? Like that's not what we're saying here. However, some of you have developed a, an abusive or foul language as a regular practice. I'm gonna challenge you to be really careful with how much you use foul or abusive language. Not because it's a sin to say a cuss word, but because it is telling a story about your heart. And even if you direct that language and that foul language to someone else or something else, it sends a message to people who are close to you about something that's true in your heart. And it's a, it's a, it's a subtle, low-level threat that, you know what, if you just cross the right line, I will do this to you. And it is a subtle threat. So I don't think every cuss word's a, an awful sin at the same time. I think we have to be careful about our language because it tells a story about our hearts. And people who are close to us have, have a dependent sort of relationship with our hearts. And so we have to be careful. When you yell and scream at, at someone at work because they've done wrong, your spouse picks up this subtle message. If I do wrong, maybe they're going to yell and scream at me. If you yell at the TV because your college football team lost and you say all those bad words, your spouse wonders or could wonder, are they going to turn on me like that if I don't come through and make them feel like a winner? So we got to be really careful with our language because out of your heart, the mouth speaks. So verse 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit or do not grieve God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So this is the pinnacle of do your own work. This is saying all this practical talk, all these values and boundaries and guidelines for healthy relationships, all this stuff, there's a core issue. And that core issue is stay in alignment with God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God or make sorrow in the Holy, on the Holy Spirit because we have the power to do that. You have the power through your words, through your choices and actions to, to bring sorrow and grief to the Holy Spirit. So the first thing, the most important thing in your marriage is actually finding alignment with the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, I want to put you first. I don't want to grieve you by what I do and the way that I live. Instead, I want to live in alignment with you. And sometimes the greatest grief I believe we put on the Holy Spirit, and I've been guilty of this, is we put our marriages before God. We say, I'm gonna have, I want to have a great marriage. I want to put my marriage first and do all this stuff. And sometimes we let our marriages outrank God. We let our families outrank God. And even Jesus said, woe to the person who, who puts 
marriage and family and mothers and fathers and in front of the kingdom. God is first. And out of putting him first, everything else falls into place. And so we must put him first. And so then in verse 31, we're getting there, guys. Hang with me. Verse 31, Paul summarizes everything. He says, so get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all evil behaviors. So he sums it all up, but he uses some really good language. Now, I want to ex explain this language uh, with what happened this week. So I walk in the door. I, I was at work. I walk in, and Amanda is at home with five boys, and our house is it's, it's a daily effort to keep clean, guys. I have five boys. It is, it is an, it, as hard as we work. It is a challenge. And so my wife announced the night before, she says, we are going to clean the playroom, which is, which is like cleaning up a war zone. So she's going to clean up the playroom. And I come home, I can hardly open the door, the back door, because there's all these garbage bags of items that she is like trashing. She's like purging, getting rid of everything. I'm not kidding you. Something like 17 Nerf guns were in trash bags. We, we got into a Nerf gun phase at our house and five boys, lots of Nerf guns, lots of bullets everywhere, you know, lots of, lots of mayhem. And, and so we have so many Nerf guns. I said, are we throwing all these away? She goes, yes, those are just the broken ones. Like we have way too many guns at our house. And so like at, at a certain point, I think the number of uh, Nerf guns, like triggers the government to come and collect guns or so. I don't know what it does. We have way too many Nerf guns. So I threw all these Nerf guns that were throwing it out. But I want you to see this because my wife is the best at getting rid of stuff. Like she is so good at that. I have to stop her sometimes because there's two kinds of people in this world. People who see an expiration date as an expiration date and people who see an expiration date as a suggestion. And, and I don't think we have to throw everything out right when it hits the date. And so I have to like stop her when she meets the fridge. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm still going to eat that. And so so we have the, our little battle over that but she is really good at getting rid of stuff and that's exactly what paul tells us to do in verse 31 he says get rid of things part of your growth in relationships is taking personal responsibility to get good at getting rid of some things we have to get good at it we have to be more like amanda we have to get good at getting rid of some things we got to get rid of bitterness anger rage harsh words slander all types of evil behavior when we see it, we got to get rid of it. We got to get good at getting rid of these character flaws that harm and pervert and limit the marriages we all want. We got to get good at that. And then he goes on in verse 32. What does he say? Instead, the opposite of those things, be kind to each other. Doc, you said it. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So just like we have to be good at getting rid, we have to get good at goodness. We have to be good at the good things. We have to learn how to bring these good things into life. We got to be kind to one another. We, can, we have to think about those things before we say them. We, have, we choose to be kind. We need to be tenderhearted. I think it's interesting about tenderhearted. We don't hear that very often. Um, I think it's good to be tenderhearted and sensitive in relationships, to be thoughtful about what may affect the other person and how it might, how it might come off to them when you say something or do something, to be tenderhearted. And I'll tell you, if you see yourself as the victim of bad things in your marriage or your relationship, um, you will not be, you will not be tenderhearted. Victim thinking is hard heartedness because it says I've been wronged and until you pay, I will not be soft or open to you. Tenderheartedness means releasing that victim mindset that you've been done wrong. And, and you open yourself up to being more tender and soft towards other people. And then he says here, he kind of lands on this idea of forgiveness. We have to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. What does it mean to be good at forgiveness? How do we, how do we forgive? And here's the reality. You married a sinful person, which means you are going to get hurt. You are going to receive the negative side of their flaws you're going to get the short end of the stick sometimes. And that means we have to be good at forgiveness. Now, I will tell you, back to our original discussion at the beginning about overlooking an offense. Um, forgiving someone does not require their agreement or their apology. Forgiving someone is something we do because Christ has forgiven us. 
So therefore you can forgive silently. You don't have to tell someone that you forgave them. In fact, I would tell you to announce to someone, hey, I, I forgive you is its own offense. Because the only time you would say, I forgive you, is after they have become aware of the offense and after they have taken responsibility for wrongs done. That's the only time you announce, I forgive you. You don't just go and say to somebody, look, I forgive you. And they're like, for what? You, you're going to start a fight. Because what if they don't agree with you? Then they're going to they're gonna think that you are just a jerk. Like, like you're high and mighty. Tell them, oh, I forgive you. Only, they'll only be able to receive that after they are aware and have acknowledged that they've done wrong. So therefore, if they haven't gotten there, or maybe this may be someone outside of your marriage, maybe someone has wronged you and they haven't taken ownership yet. Well, guess what? You don't need their ownership to forgive them. You can simply forgive silently. So uh, almost two years ago, I went to a counseling, a counseling center called Onsite, and they actually did a little workshop when I was there on forgiveness. And there were some people in my life that I, I didn't even realize at the time how much I needed to forgive them. And so they had us write uh, a letter and it's called, uh, and you put your name in it, Dear Andy. So I write, it's a letter to me, but I'm, I'm acting as if I'm the person who's offended me. So I write the letter and this is the powerful thing about it because most people who've hurt you or offended you, they could never articulate your issue like you can. Because they, there's some part of them that's not fully going to agree with you. They're not fully going to validate how you feel. So you writing this letter from them to you allows you to express all the things that you feel in a way that's healthy and private so that you can actually forgive them. Because it, it's called, the, in the, the language they used was, the letter you'll never receive. They're never going to do this. This person who's hurt you, they're never going to write this letter. They're never going to send it to you. They're never going to fall on their knees and say, I'm sorry. You just get to write this letter and keep it private and say, dear Andy, I am sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I've done. I take full ownership of these things and I ask you for your forgiveness. And what I was able to do with that letter was I was able to look at that letter and look at the person who signed it at the bottom and say, I forgive you. Now, both of the people that I wrote letters to, there's two people. Neither of them know that it was them, and neither of them ever knew I wrote the letter, and neither of them even know that I've forgiven them. And they don't have to, because that forgiveness issue is between me and God, and between me and myself. I needed to sort that out. So now, it's great. I don't have to talk about them. I don't have to feel negative things about them. Why? Because I've forgiven them. I don't harbor a lot, all this resentment. I've been able to forgive. So I want to encourage you, if you feel the need, particularly in your marriage, to sort out an offense that just seems to be an undercurrent in your relationship, there's this unforgiveness that you feel. You might need to write a letter from your spouse to you that they never see of them taking full ownership of all these things and be able to forgive them. Now, even though an apology isn't necessary, it sure is helpful. So in your marriage, if you've offended your spouse for whatever you're aware of, it's appropriate to take ownership of that and go to them and say, look, you may not remember this. This may not have offended you, but I, I feel like I've offended you and I need to say I'm sorry for that. That's healthy. That's a good opportunity. So if you're going to confront your spouse over something, it's healthy to confront your spouse on different issues, but don't start with I forgive you. Because that's, that's like blaming them for something. Instead, say, hey, this happened, and, and, it, and the story I tell myself because of this is this. And now you take ownership of your emotions. You believe the best and give them the opportunity to take ownership, and then you deal with the issue. And some forgiveness issues in relationships are big enough and destructive enough that you need a third party to help you walk through that. You just won't be able to manage that inside your own home. So if that's the case, please reach out to a counselor. Or something like that. So Paul is telling us to do our own work. Nothing in this list in the, in the latter half of Ephesians 4 is a surprise to any of us, is it? It's all straightforward, basic relationship principles. And because of that, we have the opportunity to take ownership of it and say, okay, God, I'm going to do my part. So 
Here's your, here's the response. I want, I want you to write these three things down. Number one, be honest about your marriage today. Where are you in your relationship? Be honest about reality. Number two, take an intentional step to invest in your marriage. Do your part. Do your work and not your spouse's. This is what we're called to do. This is how we have a better marriage by taking ownership and doing our own work. So I'm going to take a minute to pray and then we're going to wrap things up. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word. God, thank you for challenging us and calling us to the high standard of uh, your truth and your word. God, I pray that you will empower every person watching this right now to do their own work, to take personal responsibility, to establish good, healthy boundaries, and to live in the accountability of your word governing their relationships. And so, God, I just pray that we would honor you by the way we live so that when people see us, God, they really see the love of God displayed through our marriages. So, Lord, we uh, give our lives, our marriages, our spouses, and ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a good lesson, Pastor. How you doing? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hold on. Nikki? Tommy Cole, Pastor. Tommy Cole, can you hear me? Hey, y'all. Paige is about to sing and give her just a second. She's logging in. And if not, then Andy, you'll take it away. I know she was here, so hold on just a second. Let me just, since I know we went a little bit long, let me just wrap us up here. Oh. And, uh, yeah, we'll just do that this time. Okay, um, go. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in today. A couple of quick things. Don't forget, if you're not uh, connected to us on the Facebook page, just let Nikki know. Uh, her email address was in the chat bar. You may have to scroll up to find it, but we want to keep you informed on things. Uh, we do a Zoom like this on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1130. It's a little more casual, and I like to interact with your questions and, uh, and have more of an open discussion, but it's kind of a devotional thought in the middle of the week. Uh, so if you can make one of those or, uh, or both, that's fine. If you can't make it, that's fine too, but we just want to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, as a church family, part of worship is not just uh, singing or hearing a sermon. It is also coming together and, uh, and bringing our, our tithes and offerings. And as a church family, even though we're meeting in this scenario, there's an opportunity to give. That information will be in the chat bar. You can give online or you can mail in uh, your giving. Uh, to our uh, our mailing address if you want to do that. But we appreciate all of you who are uh, continuing your financial support of Grace Valley Church during this time. It uh, It's super helpful and allows us to keep things moving even through kind of a unique season of time in our life and our world. And um, But this, is, uh, this has been really good and I hope this is helpful to you. Uh, if you have any questions that this series has stirred up or thoughts that you might have, um, I, I truly invite you to email. You will not bother me emailing me or texting me. Please send that stuff in. I want this series to be helpful for all of us. And um, I, it's been a it's been a long time. I feel like I'm like busting at the seams to teach this stuff. So the more you send me, the the more excited I'll be. So please uh, get that stuff in. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, officially say uh, that we're church is over. You're dismissed. And if you want to hang out and talk and chit chat. Uh, I'll be on here for a few minutes, um, but I appreciate you guys being here today. Have a great Sunday.